let's say there are a couple of herbs that people believe help prevent Pre help prevent the flu. So to test this, what we do is we wait for flu season, and we randomly assign people to three different groups. And over the, the course of flu season, we have them either in one group taking herb one, and the second group taking herb two, and in the third group, they take a placebo. And if you don't know what a placebo is, it's something that to the patient or to the person uh, participating, it feels like they're taking something that you've told them might help them, but it does nothing. It could be just a sugar pill, just so it feels like medicine. The reason why you, you go, even go through the effort of giving them something is because uh, oftentimes there's something called a placebo effect, where people get better just because they're being told that they're giving that they're being given something that will make them better. So this could be this could right here just be a sugar pill. This right here could just be a sugar pill and a very small amount of sugar, so it really can't affect uh, their their actual uh, likelihood of getting the flu. So what let over here we have a table, and this is actually called a contingency table. Contingency table, contingency table. And it has on it, in each group, the number that got sick, the number that didn't get sick. And so we also can, from this, calculate the total number. So in group, in group 1, we had a total of 120 people. In group 2, we had a total of 30 plus 110 is 140 people. And in the placebo group, the, groups that did, the group just got the sugar pill, we had a total of 120. 20 people. And then we can also tabulate the number of people, the total number of people that got sick. So that's 20 plus 30 is 50, plus 30 is 80. So let me, this is the total column right over here. And then the total people that didn't get sick over here is 100 plus 110 is 210, plus 90 is 300. 300. And then the total people here are 380. Both this column and this row should add up to 380. So with that out of the way, let's think about how we can use this information in the contingency table and our knowledge of the chi-squared distribution to come up with some conclusion. So let's just make a null hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is that the herbs do nothing. The null hypothesis is, let's just assume, let me get some space here. So let's assume the null hypothesis that the herbs, herbs do Nothing. Do nothing. And then we have our alternative hypothesis, our alternate hypothesis that the herbs do something. Herbs do something. Notice I'm not I don't even care whether they actually improve. I'm just saying they do something. They might even increase your likelihood of getting the flu. We're not testing whether they're actually good. We're just saying are they different than just doing nothing? So like we did do with all of our hypothesis tests, let's just assume the null. We're going to assume Assume the null, and given that assumption, figure out the prop. Figure out if the likelihood of getting data like this or more extreme is really low. And if it is really low, then we will reject the null hypothesis. And in this test, like every hypothesis test, we need a significance level. And let's say our significance level we care about for whatever reason is 10% or 0, 0 0.10, or 10%. That's the significance level that we care about. Now, to do this, we have to figure out, we have to calculate a chi-square statistic for this contingency table. And to do that, we do it very similar to what we did with the restaurant situation. We figure out, assuming the null hypothesis, the expected results you would have gotten in each of these, in each of these cells. You can view each of these entries as a cell. You, get, you know, that's what we do with it. You call each of those entries in Excel also a cell, each of the entries in a table. What we do is we figure out what the expected value would have been, would have been if the null hypothesis, if you do assume the null hypothesis, then we find this, we, the square distance from that expected value, and we, we, uh, we, I guess you could call it, normalize it by the expected value, take the sum of all of those differences, and if, that's, if, that, if those differences, those square differences are really big, the probability of getting it would be really small, and maybe we'll reject the null hypothesis. So let's just figure out how we can get the expected, the expected number. So we're assuming the herbs do nothing. So if the herbs do nothing, then we can just figure out that you know, this whole population, they just had nothing happen to them. These herbs were useless. And so we can, figure, we can use this population sample, or I shouldn't call it the population. We should use this sample right here to figure out the expected number of people who would get sick or not sick. And so over here, over here, we have 80 out of 380 did not get sick. And I want to be careful. I, I just said the word population. But we haven't sampled the whole universe of all people taking this herb. This is a sample. So I don't want to confuse you. 
I was using the population in more of the conversational sense than the statistical sense. But anyway, of our sample, and we're using all of the data because we, you know, there's, we're assuming there's no difference. We might as well just use the total data to figure out the expected frequency of getting sick and not getting sick. So 80 divided by 380 did not get sick, and that's 21%. 21% did not get sick. So let me write that over here. So 21, that's 21% of the total. And then if this would be 79%, if we just subtract 1 minus 21. We could divide 300 by 380. We should get 79% as well. So we would expect, one would expect the 21% of each of, of your total, based on the total sample right over here, that you would our best guess is that 21% should be getting sick, and 79% should not be getting sick. So let's look at it for each of these groups. If we assume that 21% of these 120 people should have gotten sick, what would have been the expected value right over here? So let's just multiply 21%. Let's just multiply this 21% times 120. So let's just multiply that times 120. That gets us to 25. Point I'll just round it. 25.3 people should have gotten sick. So the expected, so let me write it over here. I'll do expected in in yellow. So the expected, the expected right over here, if you assume that 21% of each group should have gotten sick, is that you would have expected 25.3 people to get sick in group one, in herb one group. And then the remainder will not get sick. So let's just let's just subtract. Let's just, or I could actually multiply 79% times 120. Either one of those will be good. But let me just take 120 minus 25.3, and then I get 94.7. 94.7. So you would have expected 94.7 to not get sick. 94, so this is expected again. Expected. Expected. 94. 0.7 to not get sick. And now let's do that for each of these groups. So once again, group two, you would have expected 21% to get sick. 21% of the total people in that group, so that's 140. So that's 29.4. And then the remainder, see 140 minus 29.4, should not have gotten sick. So that gets us this right here. We have 20. 29.4 should have gotten sick if the herbs did nothing. And then over here, we would have 110, 110.6 should not have gotten sick. And these are pretty close. So just looking at the numbers, it looks like this herb doesn't do too much relative to the total, or the, all of the groups combined. And then in the placebo group, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. You have 30, sorry, we expect 21% to get sick. 21% of our group of 120. So it's 25.2. 25.2. So this right over here. And actually, I should I should make this. This should be a 25 point, since we're rounding. Actually, these will be the same number over here. So I, I said 21%, but it's 21 point something, something, something. The group sizes are the same. So we should expect the same proportion to get six. So I'll say 25. Point three, just to make it consistent. The reason why I got 25.2 just now is because I lost some of the trailing decimals over here. But since I had them over here, I'm going to use them over here as well. And then over here in this group, you would you would expect 94.7, 94.7 to get sick. So if you just actually relied on this data, it looks like herb two is actually to some degree even worse than it's even worse than the uh, oh, no, no, I take that back. It's not worse, because you would have expected a small number, and a lot of people got sick here. So this is the placebo. Well, anyway, we don't want to make judgments just staring at the numbers. Let's figure out our chi-squared statist statistic. And to do that, let's get our statistic, our chi-squared statistic. I'll write it like this, maybe for fun, or maybe I'll write it as a big X because it's really uh, it, 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 this 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 random variables distribution is approximately a chi-square distribution. So I'll write it like that. And well, we'll talk about the degrees of freedom in a second. Actually, let me write it the curly X just so you see that some people write it with the chi instead of the X. So our chi-square statistic over here, we're literally just going to find the the squared distance between the observed and expected, and then divide it by the expected. So it's going to be 20 minus 25.3. 20 minus 25.3 squared over 25.3. 25.3 
plus 30 minus 29.4 squared over 29.4. I'm going to run out of space. Plus 30 minus 25.3 squared over 25.3. And then I'm going to have to do these over here. So let me just continue it. You can ignore this h1 over here. So plus, plus 100 minus 94.7 squared over 94.7. Plus, I think you see where this is going, 110 minus 110.6 squared over 110.6. And then finally, plus 90 over 94 point, sorry, 90 minus 94.7. We scroll to the right a little bit. Squared all of that over 94.7. So let me just get the calculator out to calculate this. Take a little bit of time. So we have, I'll have to type it on the calculator for these parentheses. So we have 20 minus 20 minus 25.3 squared divided by 25.3 plus open parentheses 30 minus 29.4 squared divided by 29.4 plus, open parentheses, 30 minus 25.3, 25.3 squared divided by 25.3, halfway there, plus 100. Open parentheses. This is the tedious part. 100 minus 94.7 squared divided by 94.7 plus 110 minus, well, this will, I'll actually type it out. We can do a lot of these in our head, but let me just do it. 110 minus 110.6 squared divided by 110.6. And then the last one, home stretch, assuming we haven't made any mistakes. We have 90 minus 94.7 squared divided by 94.7. And let's see what we get. We get 2.528. So let's just say it's 2.53. So our chi, our chi square statistic, I always have trouble saying that, our chi square statistic, assuming the null hypothesis is correct, is equal to 2.5253. Now, the next thing we have to do is figure out the degrees of freedom that we had in calculating this chi-square statistic. And I'll give you the rule of thumb, and I'll give you a little bit of a sense of why this is the rule of thumb for a contingency table like this. And in the future, we'll talk a little bit more deeply about degrees of freedom. So when you do the rule of thumb for a contingency table is you have the number of rows, so you have rows, and then you have your number of columns. So here we have two rows and we have three columns. You don't count the totals. So you have three columns over here. And the degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom, and this is the rule of thumb, the degrees of freedom for your contingency table is going to be the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. In our situation, we have two rows and three columns. So it's going to be 2 minus 1 times 3 minus 1. So it's going to be 2 minus 1 times 3 minus 1, which is just 1 times 2, which is 2. We have two degrees of freedom. Now, the reason that that should make a little bit of intuitive sense, we'll talk about this in more depth in the future, is that if you, if you assume that you know the totals, so let's just assume that you know the totals. So if you know all of this information over here, if you know the total information, or if or actually if you knew the parameters of the population as well but if you know the total information and if you know this information or if you know if you know r minus 1 of the r minus 1 of the information in the rows the last one can be figured out just by subtracting from the total so for example in this situation if you know this you can easily figure out this this is not new information it's just the total minus 20 same thing if you know this one right over here this one over here is not new information and similarly if you know these two, this guy over here isn't new information. You can just you can always just calculate him based on the total and everything else. So that's the sense of why our degrees of freedom are the the, the columns minus one times the rows minus one. But anyway, so our chi-square statistic has 
two degrees of freedom. So what we have to do is remember our alpha value. Let me get it up here. We had it right over here. Our significance level that we care about, our alpha value is 10%. Let me rewrite it over here. So our alpha is 10%. So what we're going to do is figure out what is the critical chi, what is our critical chi square statistic that gives us an alpha of 10%. If this is more extreme than that, if the probability of getting this is even less than that critical statistic, it'll be less than 10% and we'll reject the null hypothesis. If it's not more extreme, then we won't reject the null hypothesis. So what we need to do is to figure out with a chi square distribution and two degrees of freedom, what is our critical chi square statistic. So let's just go back. So we have two degrees of freedom. We have two degrees of freedom here. And we have a critical, we care about a significance level of 10%. Uh, 10%. So our critical, our critical chi square value is 4.60. So another way to visualize this, if we look at the chi square distribution with two degrees of freedom, that's this blue one over here this blue one over here, at a value of, I'm trying to pick a nice blue to use, at a value of, a critical value of 4.60. So 4.60, this is 5. So 4.60 will be right around here. At a critical value of 4.60, so this is 4.60, you have t the probability of getting something that ex at least that extreme, so that extreme or more extreme, is 10%. This is our this is what we care about. Now, if the chi-square statistic that we calculated falls into this rejection region, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. But our chi-square statistic is only 2.53. It is only 2.53. So it's sitting, it's sitting someplace right over here. Is actually ours. So it's actually very. It's it's not that crazy to get it if you assume the null hypothesis. So based on our data that we have right now, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So we cannot, we don't know for a fact that the herbs do nothing, but we can't say that they do something based on this. So we're not going to reject it. We won't say 100% that it's true, but we can't say that we're rejecting it. So at least from this point of view, uh, we, we, it doesn't look like the herbs did anything that would make us believe that, they, that they're, they're any different uh, than, than each other. And one of the herbs is obviously a placebo, so any different than a placebo or each other.